Welcome back to Rafford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are on Chapter 2, which is entitled Silver and Ash, and we are on the bottom of page 78. We're about to read a nut, the next segment, which is entitled Plagues. But before we do that, I would ask you to please share this episode on a social media platform or a group chat or a Gmail or Discord, whatever it is that you may use to get your social media itch out, please share this link on there. We want to remind people, depending, because you may be listening to this on one platform and it's not the platform you use all the time. You may be listening to this with a friend and you want to be able to find this podcast yourself. So we want to let people know that the Rockford Reading Daily Podcast is a podcast from the May 30th Alliance Podcast Network. And you can find this podcast series on YouTube, on Facebook, on SoundCloud, on Pocket Cast on Anchor, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, anywhere audio is available. This podcast series is also available. <clears throat> now, previously on Rafa Reading Daily, as we were reading through Hinterland, we read about some of the statistics of urban poverty in comparison to rural poverty. We read about how rural poverty stacks up for different groups of color, different people of color. We read about that the, we got some more descriptions of what these hinterlands look like. The deeper we get into this book, the more we uh, sort of get immersed in the the world of these hinterlands and can and get descriptions on the things that people see, the things that people love about these places. And we also begin to understand deeper the things that people uh, don't like about or hate. I don't say hate, but the things that people don't like about the changes that have come in some of these places when it comes to the uh, the way the economy is shifting when it comes to the control that the government has in some of these areas, when it comes to the lack of resources that are exist in these areas. And the deeper we get into this book, the more I get a, a picture and a feel of what the rural landscape is like. And the more I understand the importance of having an understanding of, of what rural life in America is like to be able to, compare and contrast with urban life, but also to be able to articulate and communicate to more people the the importance of us working collectively to combat some of the issues that we all face. And I think that when you want to explain to people the importance of working collectively, you can only do that when you have taken the time to learn what they may be individually facing. And so Hinterland has done a good job of showing us what people uh in the these rural areas are are facing. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the next section, which is entitled Plagues. This divergence in economic activity is only beginning to take political shape. A hint of it was finally visible in the 2016 election when that vast terra incognita dubbed Trump dubbed quote Trump County or Trump Country, excuse me, end quote was finally slided from the twin peninsulas of liberal America. The economic character of the divergence could not have been more clear. Clinton almost universally carried the high output metropolitan counties, comprising, quote, a massive 64% of America's economic activity as measured by total output in 2015, end quote. While, quote, Trump land consists of hundreds and hundreds of tiny, low output locations that comprise the non-metropolitan hinterland of America, along with some suburban and exurban metro counties, end quote. Although altogether, quote, Trump's supporting counties generated just 36 percent of the country's output, end quote. Trump's most politically active base was in wealthier exurbs and in the counties of the far hinterland, he was carried to the presidency more by rising shares of non-voters than by any sort of active support. Nonetheless, his election signals this greater divide and, quote, for a losing presidential candidate to have represented so large a share of the nation's economic base appears to be unprecedented in the era of modern economic statistics, end quote. Despite being a rich urbanite whose occupation is little more than the pouring of inherited wealth into gaudy, gilded palaces, Trump himself has become a sort of strange, terrifying specter of the starved heartland, a golden flesh death god summoned by deindustrialization, his distance from this devastation a mark of his own grim divinity. There is a strong, 
probably could. Excuse me. There is a strong, probably congenital desire in American liberalism to blame such conservative political turns on some deeply ingrained ignorance bred into people by the soil and water of the heartland. The election of Trump was no exception, and the normal accusations ran their course through the encyclopedia of rural degeneracy before turning, finally, to that good, trusted enemy of the American polity, Russia and her allies. However disparaging, this process did at least return some attention to the question of white poverty in the U.S., so religiously ignored by those on the left. While rural America is clearly not synonymous with whiteness, it remains true that whites still compose a massive share of both the national and rural populations, and rural areas see some of the most extreme examples of poverty among all racial groups. Because of the extremity of the crisis in the far hinterland, the area also acts as a sort of window into the future of class conflict in the United States. The resulting image, however, is not the one favored by the metropolitan think piece, which sees racial resentment as the natural outcome of such, quote, economic anxiety, end quote. Instead, traditional methods of transforming class antagonism into racial difference are beginning to reach a sort of saturation point, as unemployment, mortality, and morbidity rates all start to overspill their historically racial boundaries. The effects of this are extremely unpredictable, and political support will tend to follow whomever can offer the greatest semblance of strength and stability. But the left is neither strong nor stable. Liberals ignore these areas because low output, low population regions very simply do not matter much when it comes to administering the economy, and that is, in the end, what liberalism is about. The far left, on the other hand, has long been in a state of widespread degeneration. It has retreated from historic strongholds in the hinterland, such as West Virginia, once a hotbed for wildcat strikes and communist organizing, to cluster around the urban cores of major coastal cities and a spattering of college towns. One symptom of this more widespread degeneration has also been an inward turn, mass organizing replaced by the management of an increasingly minuscule social scene and politics itself re-envisioned as the cult-like repetition of hollow rituals accompanied by the continual self-flagellating rectification of one's words, thoughts, and interpersonal, interpersonal interactions. Theoretical rigor has atrophied in the majority within the amorphous social scene that composes, quote, the left, end quote, only vaguely understands what capitalism is. This condition tends to blur the border between left and right, as both will offer solutions that lie somewhere between localist communitarianism and protectionist development of the, quote, real economy, end quote. Another symptom is the neurotic obsession with anatomizing oppression and the assumption that revolutionary activists must originate from the, quote, most oppressed, end quote, within a population. Class war and the revolutionary potentials that can be opened by it are inherently contingent. There is no, quote, revolutionary subject, end quote, out there waiting to be discovered by leftist bloggers. To the extent that there is a correlation between one's experience of oppression and one's openness to revolution, it tends to be a nonlinear probability distribution, with the highest probability lying not among the, quote, most oppressed, end quote, but among the groups who, for whatever reason, had experienced some degree of prolonged improvement in their condition, followed by a sudden, sharp reversal. In certain ways, this describes the post-civil rights experience of the black population, seemingly advanced by desegregation and the growth in home ownership, all capped by the rise of a not insubstantial black ruling class and the election of Barack Obama. This, quote, post-racial, end quote, America was, of course, quickly proven hollow, as the housing crash dispossessed black homeowners, mass incarceration increased in scope, and extrajudicial killings of black youth skyrocketed. The, politics, the political significance of this will be explored in later chapters. But what is often not acknowledged is that poor whites tend to have experienced a similar curve in their prospects, despite the absolute difference in their degree of social power. Young white workers, after all, have some of the lowest probabilities of ever doing better than their parents, even while they are on average much better educated, and it is these relative reversals that tend to have the strongest subjective effects. 
Maybe most importantly, white still compose an unarguably substantial portion of the American proletariat, even if the, quote, white working class, end quote, is essentially an empty signifier. Poverty data, while an inadequate stand-in for the complexities of class position, nonetheless offers some insight. While the share of whites below the poverty line is consistently lower compared to other groups, those shares for all are higher for ruralities. In absolute numbers, whites still compose the largest single group living in poverty in the United States at 17.98 million family units, or 41.3% of the total number, 43.5 million, of families under the poverty line. They are followed by the Hispanic population at 12.23 million, 28% in total poverty, and the black population at 9.6 million, 21% in total poverty. In the rural core of white poverty, centered in Appalachia, but also with significant swaths in the Rust Belt and Pacific Northwest, the statewide shares of whites living under the poverty line can reach as high as 17% in Kentucky. And again, while the share is much higher for the black, 36%, and Hispanic, 42% population, the 646, eight, the 646 and 800,000 white families living under the poverty line in Kentucky account for 74.3% of the state's poor. Alongside poverty come higher rates of unemployment, imprisonment, and drug use, and skyrocketing mortality and morbidity rates. The county that sends the most people to prison per capita, often with much longer sentences than elsewhere, is largely white Dearborn County, Indiana, with 114 prison admissions per 10,000 residents. But the phenomenon is not limited to any peculiarity of this blindingly white Indiana exurb. Imprisonment rates in small counties, those with fewer than 100,000 people, have been growing rapidly nationwide for the past decade, overcoming the rates in mid-sized and populous counties sometime between 2008 and 2009, and all without any comparable increase in crime. Part of this shift can be attributed to the recent adoption of mass incarceration as a political issue by urban liberals, sparked by best-selling exposés such as Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, which has led to a welcome decrease in the incarceration rate within most major American cities, including a substantial decrease in the incarceration rate among the black population. But the curious counterpart to this phenomenon has always been an increase in the incarceration rate among whites. Though still disproportionately small compared to the rate experienced by the black, native, or Hispanic populations, it has been steadily rising over the past decade, the starkest increase being among white women, among whom the rate rose some seven, among whom the rate rose some 56% between 2000 and 2014. Okay, let's have a reflection here real quick. So we have got into the point in the book where we are hearing a lot about mass incarceration. Again, I want to point out that I had not read this book before. This was a book that was donated to the May 30th Alliance. I was told it would be very, uh, that it was very informational about capitalism and, and classism. And, but I wasn't sure exactly what all was going to be entailed into the book. And so I figured that I might be just doing maybe a mostly racial injustice type thing uh, that I was trying to pull from it and trying to expand more on pine capitalism and things like that. But we have seen small little hints of racial injustice. Well, I said racial injustice, but we've seen small little hints of speaking about racial injustice. We've seen small little things about mass incarceration here and there. And at this portion, we are now getting a, a deep amount of information about how mass incarceration operates in some of these hinterland areas. And what stands out to me is the, the statistics, of course, of the amount of white women that we just read about, the increase of, of imprisonment amongst white women, that's also been true for black women. That's just a, a women thing, I would think, if I was to, to, to analyze what I've read about black women being increased in prison populations and now what I've just read about white women being increased in prison populations. And that is always a... It's always a reminder that, you know, we do live in this misogynistic society. And so even though part of living in a misogynistic society is this idea that women need to be protected or women are to be, are to be protected uh, because, you know, for some like as if they can't protect themselves. But also part of what comes with that is 
and this is again the hypocrisies of America. Part of this misogynistic mindset is uh, women can't women can't do certain things, so men have to do it for them to protect the woman. But then at the same in the same token, you see how vulnerable women are in the society and how they are they are when they are in the position of whether being victimized or being the person accused of committing a crime or accused of victimizing somebody that they are, that they are even then more vulnerable to whatever the negative aspects of these institutions are. And so what I mean by that is that a woman being assaulted or a woman being raped is probably going to have and has statistically have a less likely for a conviction for the person who has done these things. Uh, and on the same token, a woman it being accused of certain things or being charged for certain things is probably going to have less protections for her as well. And, and that's, that same thing can be true for black people that I'm sure that on, on whole historically black people, when they have been victimized, have had less, have less times have seen the person or people who have victimized them held accountable by the state. And then on the opposite token, they have been, made examples out of when they are the ones who have been accused or charged with victimizing somebody. And so that's sort of the double-edged sword that exists in some of these, in, in these hypocrisies in this, in the, in the country. <clears throat> and so that's what, that stands out to me reading that sentence about the increase of white women uh, being in prison from 2000 to 2014. What also stands out to me is them speaking about the increase in, in rural imprisonment and the decrease in urban imprisonment. And the Dearborn County being the county with the uh, longest prison sentences per capita uh, in Indiana. I think that that's also very, excuse me, that's also very enlightening. I don't know much about uh, Indiana. Uh, let me see something here. Also found it the the defining of liberals and the what liberals care about and liberalism being about the economy administering the economy is something that I found to be very very true to my experience here in Rockford Illinois the, there's liberals run the city here the cons conservative liberals at that if that's even but and the main thing that they're always doing is 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 money economy is putting money into downtown or creating some program so you can for young black people to be able to be interns in the city and giving money to this, giving money to these programs that have been co-opted by the city. And, but it's never really any tangible things to dealing with the causes of the issues that exist within the city. It's just always this redistribution of money or, uh, and it's redistribution of money to Entities that are not going to be dealing with the root causes of issues, but again, entities that are only dealing with the effects. And and also I, what I found interesting was the poverty. They broke down how poverty is experienced through different from different races. And I found that to be very enlightening and very important. And I think that speaking about poverty can be a unifying subject you know because so many people from different communities different cities different areas experience poverty and understand poverty and so many of us do live in poverty okay let's move on to the next section the same rural area oh Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, my fault. <laughs> the same rural areas that have been rapidly increasing their incarceration rates are also those that have seen skyrocketing rates of drug addiction and overdose deaths over the past 20 years. In Stark County, Ohio, almost 89% white, so many people have overdosed on opiates that local morgues have had to order cold storage trailers just to contain all the corpses. The overdose death rate is so high that the CDC is now comparing it to the peak of the HIV epidemic. But whereas HIV deaths were far more concentrated in cities, the last decade's spike in overdoses is visible in both urban and rural areas, with the rural rate jumping above the urban beginning in the mid-2000s. Today, some of the highest overdose rates are found in the rural Appalachia and the Southwest. The phenomenon thereby spans the rural racial divide with some of the strongest concentrations of overdose deaths in West Virginia and New Mexico, 
states that have completely opposite shares of rural white population. And drug overdoses compose only one portion of a startlingly fast increase in the death rate among rural whites, even while death rates for all other groups continue to fall. In fact, increasing death rates tend to be extremely uncommon in developed countries short of war or substantial political and economic collapse. As with the poverty rate, whites on average still tend to have lower overall death rates than other groups, but this increasing mortality and morbidity is, again, something experienced by a substantial number of people. And in certain respects, even the larger racial pattern is beginning to reverse. Quote, in at least 30 counties in the South, black women in midlife now have a lower mortality rate than middle-aged white women, end quote. The trend spans genders and age groups, but is strongest among those with only a high school education, among whom the reversal is remarkable. Quote, death rates for white non-Hispanics with a high school education or less now exceeds those of blacks overall, end quote. Especially prominent is the spiking mortality rate among older workers with only a high school diploma, among whom the death rate is, quote, 30% higher for whites age 50 to 54 than for blacks overall of that age, end quote. Alongside drug overdoses, suicides, and cirrhosis of the liver that have led, the, led to the increase in mortality, excuse me, alongside drug overdoses, suicide and cirrhosis of the liver have led to the increase in mortality. While the increase appears most clearly in the states with the poorest rural areas, it is not directly correlated with any rise in the poverty rate over the same period of time. If history is any indicator, the social plagues that just stayed in the swamps and wastelands of the rural fringe eventually make their way to the gates of the palace. Death, addiction, and imprisonment feed into that apocalyptic atmosphere, the population teetering somewhere between sorrow, apathy, and rage. But rural whites won't just die off as much as urban liberals might prefer such an outcome. Instead, the plague gives flesh to the mythology of the far right. These skyrocketing deaths seem to offer a concrete character, however fleeting and inaccurate, to the old white nationalist claim that white people are somehow being systematically killed. Of course, the phenomenon has none of the conspiratorial airs that the far right imagines, and in most areas, whites still retain a strong structural advantage in access to education, health care, and all the other factors that contribute to lower mortality and greater well-being. It is nonetheless notable that the divergence in mortality between whites with only a high school diploma and largely urban whites with college educations is now greater than the divergence between the average rate for the black population and those same college-educated whites. This has created a situation in which none of the components of what liberals like to call, quote, privilege, end quote, are necessarily visible from the depths of the mountain poverty in the Appalachians or the claimants. Individuals might be raised by opiate addicted parents, work ugly, deadly, and short lived jobs, struggle to make child care payments or tend to drug addicted and imprisoned relatives. If they seek government assistance, there will be little or none aside from the military. They may not even be able to apply for financial aid for school if their family's black market livelihoods mean that their parents file no taxes. If they somehow do finally make it to any urban area for work, they may be more likely to be hired for entry-level positions or less likely to be shot in the street, but the cultural and educational gap will neutralize most other advantages. They will also quickly contrast their own plight with that of the city's other poor residents, noting what appears to be a wealth of resources provided via government aid programs and nonprofits for everyone but them. In some places, they will see overseas immigrants, particularly resettled refugees, being given free housing and job training. In others, they will see no in others they will see nonprofits offering free classes in financial planning or help for students applying for financial aid, but all targeted toward, quote, people of color, end quote. One of those strange liberal sh Shibboleths? Shibboleths that seem almost designed to trick the ignorant into saying, quote, color people, end quote, in order to give better off urbanites a proper target for class hatred, thinly disguised as self-righteous scorn. It's important to remember that the perception of such inequities certainly exceeds their reality, but they are not entirely imaginary. A rural migrant from McDowell County, West Virginia, is essentially an internal refugee 
fleeing a majority white county that has a premature death rate, 861.2 per 100,000 population, exceeded only by that of the notoriously poor Pine Ridge Reservation. But there are not only no substantial welfare programs targeting these parts of the country, there are also no NGOs or resettlement agencies waiting to aid these refugees when they escape such devastation. The irony is, of course, that the white rural migrant has far more in common with his Mexican, East African, or Middle Eastern counterpart than with the urban professional. But this commonality is obscured from both ends by racial resentment and Islamophobia stoked among the poor and by the identitarian politics of privilege promoted by wealthier urbanites. Since whites compose the bulk of the impoverished population, if not always its lowest rungs, the far left's persistent refusal to address white poverty is a refusal to address the conditions of the single largest demographic composing the lower class in the United States, and one that has very clearly experienced the J-curve of heightened expectations suddenly plummet plummeting into a sharp reversal of prospects. This is an inherently politicizing process, and at this point, the far right has been almost the only force attempting to shape it. They tend to target the perceived inequities pointed out above, combining xenophobia with the very simple economic calculus. The Idaho Three Percenters, for example, argue that the state ought not waste so many resources resettling refugees when it is already doing such a poor job of helping its own impoverished citizens. This is the gateway argument for the entire program of localist Islamophobia, which reaches its natural conclusion when they propose a world of bearded, rifle-toting patriarchs defending their respective compounds in the Rocky Mountains. There are a few simple lessons that might be drawn from all of this. The first overarching observation is simply that the future of class war in the United States is beginning to enter a period of severe polarization and extreme contingency. More and more people are becoming aware that liberalism is a failed political project. The ability of partisans to succeed in the environment of competitive control opened up by this failure will correlate to their ability to offer strength and stability to populations in the midst of crisis. Many of these openings are appearing first in the far hinterland, where the transposition of class antagonism onto racial divides in income, imprisonment, and mortality is reaching a saturation point, the very intensity of long-term economic crisis producing a commensurate crisis in the process of racialization itself. But while organizing among poor whites is a persistent necessity of any future revolutionary prospect, the far hinterland does not provide a solid foundation for such activity, due to its low share of total population, crumbling infrastructure, and distance from key flows within the global economy. Any attempt to organize in such conditions is quickly transformed into a quasi-communitarian attempt at local self-reliance, the endless repetition of those failed downriver communes, which invariably becomes retreats for urban Buddhist or walled compounds flying money-colored flags. It should not in any way be remarkable that the far right has built some marginal support amongst rural whites then. What is remarkable is the fact that their support among the rural poor has thus far been so marginal. Similarly, Trump was catapulted into the presidency not by resounding support among poor ruralities, but instead by a massive wave of non-participation as neither party had anything to offer. If white ruralities were as inherently conservative as the average leftist would have us believe, they should be flooding into far-right organizations in unprecedented numbers, demanding a platform for their racial resentment. But the reality is that, whether left-wing or right-wing, political activity is something that is built, not something that emerges naturally from the experience of oppression. This experience only places the success of political organization along a probabilistic curve and colors the character of its result. The far right has only been capable of attracting newcomers in rural areas in a spare few locations. Much of their apparent support base comes either from historical strongholds, such as the KKK counties of the South and those areas of Idaho, Montana, and Washington, where white supremacists relocated in the 1990s, or from widening exurbs, which have acted as a sort of geographical catchment for racial resentment in the United States and have recently begun to reach the limit of their urban tether. Maybe more importantly, in order to attract new recruits, the far right has had to tone down its explicit racism and foreground economics. But even this has been met mostly with apathy and wariness. 
the white population of the far hinterland still seems to find more promise in opiates than politics. Okay, and we're going to end this episode here. Let's have a short reflection. So what stands out to me through that last passage we just read is how Phil Neal explains that oppression is not simply, a, is oppression in itself is not enough to radicalize people or to organize people or to make people want to be organized or to make people want to be more uh, politically active. He spoke about how the rising of expectations or getting to or, or rising up the ladder or rising up the rising up the 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 class class ladder rising up in some type of a way your social status rising up in some type of a way as a whole as a community as a whole and then taking a a nose dive is something that is more something that is more conducive to people becoming radicalized or people becoming organized or people becoming active politically than just simply being black or just simply being poor or simply uh, being marginalized. And I find that to be something that's very true. Uh, I think that I found at the beginning of my journey two, two years ago, two years ago, two years ago, some months, I thought that that was the thing that if I just, if we, if, started reaching more black people or started reaching more poor people or reaching more people who had dealt with some of these negative impacts of police terrorism and mass incarceration and racial injustice. We'd be able to build up a base. We get that base built up. We'd be able to start to gain some type of power. We'd be able to use that power uh, for influence and we'd be able to change things uh, slowly but surely. And what was a waking up moment for me was realizing that some of the people who have been the most oppressed, who have been the most marginalized, who have felt these things in the closest proximity are a lot of times the people who want to stay the farthest away from it, who want to just be able to get out of the way of politics or get out of the way of of radicalizing or of combating these issues and want to just find a way to uh, survive and make it through life, you know, and, and just try to make however much money they can and hope they never have to deal with these things again. And so I found, I find the things that he's saying in there about liberals and Democrats sort of playing on these, these racial, racial tropes or these racial stereotypes or these racial superstitions to make black people believe or people of color believe that there's this large group of white supremacists or white nationalists or uh, alt-right people in these hinterland areas. And they're the cause for Trump being elected or they're the cause for some of the conservative politics uh, becoming more prominent in the however many years. I thought that he did a good job of dispelling that as being true and stating that a lot of these things, and which is something that I've, I've realized in, in my journey is that so many of these things are, are political ploys. And I feel like he did a good job of, of detailing some of the democratic and liberal political ploys and why they won't be enough to help us in to deal with the things that we're facing now as a society. Um, also, I think about, I read, he, he brought up in this passage, the book, the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, which is a book I've read a couple of times. We have not read it on the Rockford reading daily podcast series, but we will get to it eventually. Uh, but within that book, Michelle Alexander speaks about how one of the dangers of, organizing and one of the dangers of organizing around police terrorism and mass incarceration can be and racial injustice can be leaving or forgetting about the white people who are affected by these things, forgetting about the poor white people who deal with these same things and not uh, including them in the, your organizing efforts because that builds up a, a base of, of a counter base or a, a group of people who feel adversarial towards you because they feel left out of the, uh, issue or left out of the the struggle, even though they're still dealing with these same things, similar things. And that was something that's always stuck with me. I think I read that in, I mean, I read the book in 2020 and in 2020. Well, I read the book twice in 2021. And that's something, something that stuck with me on my second time of reading it is the importance of making sure that when we're organizing these things, that they are inclusive and that we're not building the same type of 
organizations that and that we're not building organizations that mimic the things that we don't like about these institutions we're combating. And so when Phil A. Neal talks about the poverty rate with white people, the unemployment rate with white people, the imprisonment rate with white people, the uh, mortality and morbidity rate with white people and the fluctuations of it, I think that that's something that's important to take note to because those are pieces of information to be able to use to explain to white people in rural areas or white people in urban settings that we are facing similar issues and we are facing and if we and if we don't face these similar issues collectively then individually and separately we will end up succumbing to some of these issues so that's my takeaway from this passage that we just read i think we got about like four pages left in this chapter so we'll finish that up next episode and next episode will probably be a little bit shorter than the episode after that we will begin on the next chapter of Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict. Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide you the opportunity to begin or further your journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I'll holler at you tomorrow.